So when we do custom tuning, there really is no free lunch, meaning the manufacturers have pretty much maximized what you're gonna get out of the powertrain. Now, of course, if you have special circumstances like you're looking for economy, you're looking for performance, or the environment. Remember, the OE manufacturer has to have these vehicles run in zero degree weather and 110 degree weather. So if you live in the Southwest and you're never gonna see those cold temps, you can tweak the tune to accommodate that environment. So what are we gonna look for? Well, look right here. We're getting on the freeway. We're under a relatively heavy load. Now this is a six liter engine, an L96. And notice that our knock retard is active. Now that we level out, it went to zero. So I'm not sure how much more spark we're gonna be able to put into this. We might be able to put a little more spark in in the bottom end when we're not under such a high load, get a little bit better throttle response. Of course we wanna look at our coolant temp and intake temp and all the other parameters, but knock retard is really important because what a lot of guys will do is they'll just add spark and walk away. You can't do that. So the first thing I think we should talk about is the different modes. There's closed loop and open loop. Closed loop means you're running off the O2s. When you're running closed loop, you're going to be running stoichiometric, which is about 14.5 to 14.7 to 1 on gasoline. Now when it comes to performance, you're most likely going to switch out of closed loop and go into open loop so we can put more fuel into it. So if you put more spark into it, the odds are you're going to have to put more fuel into it. You don't want the engine to run lean. Now a lot of you guys say, well, they have knock sensors on these engines. Why not just crank the spark up? And that kind of is what we do. There's a low octane table and a high octane table. Obviously the low octane table is the base spark when you're using core grade fuel. And then the high octane is when you're using the high octane fuel. There's something called an octane scaler. And the computer uses feedback from the knock sensors for a spark adaptive. So it kind of learns what fuel is in there. You might have some crappy gas in it and it's knocking a lot. And what'll happen is the knock counts will build up the computer will see that and then it'll start scaling the octane scaler back to the low scale. A lot of tuners will crank up both the low and the high octane table. I'm not a real big fan of that because once you force that low octane table up, you're basically forcing the operating system to put more spark in than the engine really wants. And remember, a lot of this is based on the fuel that you use. I remember in the early days with my 09 JK, I put in the 93 octane tune and it would just knock like crazy, even on premium gas. So I was getting less fuel economy because once it starts to knock, the computer starts to pull that spark back and back. So I ended up running the 89 tune and even in that, it, it continued to knock. You can't just throw spark into a tune and expect it to work. I also wanna keep this simple and I wanna keep it safe. So you can see we're going up this parkway. It's relatively warm outside and we're not really knocking at all at cruise. So we're pretty close to where we need to be. And remember, that spark adaptive will kind of fine tune to the fuel that you have. One of the reasons these operating systems run a fuel level sensor is when you replace the gas, the computer now knows that and it resets the adaptives like the fuel and the spark adaptives. So under extreme conditions, like you're going up a steep hill, it's 110 degrees out, air conditioning's on, you're fully loaded towing a trailer, the manufacturers have to protect the engine against that. Now it's unlikely you're gonna be in that situation most of the time, so we can crank a little bit more into this thing and get some better performance out without really sacrificing reliability or longevity and drivability. Now putting spark in it and fuel is gonna give you better throttle response, but like I said earlier, there is no free lunch. Something's gonna suffer if you change it, whether it's emissions. A lot of you guys say, oh, why don't we just put lean cruise in? And we did. You put lean cruise in, you can increase the fuel economy dramatically, but you're also putting out a lot more NOx or nitrates of oxygen because the combustion chamber temperatures get really hot when you run those lean burn combustion chambers. So it's always a trade-off. If you see a benefit in performance, you're probably gonna get less economy because you're using more fuel. And performance enrichment is what we're gonna talk about next. So by adding a little bit of spark into the operating system, you're probably gonna get a little bit better throttle response. But I want you to monitor the spark knock. Now don't add more than I'd say two or three degrees over the factory operating system. Now you notice now that we've been driving for a while, engines warmed up, spark adaptives, because we just got fuel by the way. Now I'm accelerating out pretty hard and we're staying at zero. So the spark adaptives have reset. So when you put in extra spark, you're probably gonna wanna put in a little bit of extra fuel. And when I say extra fuel, you say, yeah, but you're running off the O2s, you're running closed loop. That's controlled by that closed loop feedback system. And, and you're right. But what we're talking about is performance enrichment. 
Performance enrichment is an open loop mode. So when you get on the throttle and you need more power, it'll kick into open loop, ignore the O2 sensors, and just start dumping fuel into it. Now, you're gonna get a lot better performance if you do that. Most of the tables are in lambda. One lambda is stoichiometric, or about 14.7 to one with gasoline. So if you wanna richen it up, let's say you go from 14.7 to 12 to 1 and the computer has different open loop modes for performance enrichment it's still looking at the map sensor rpm and other things so if you're going up a steep grade it's going to go into performance enrichment if you're under heavy enough load and it's going to vary the fuel even in open loop to match the conditions now guys this is a caveat tune your engine at your own risk i've seen a lot of guys ruin their engines i had a guy recently who took his performance enrichment and instead of putting 0.8 in which would be about 12 to 1 he put in 8 the operating system just dumped fuel into it like pouring it down the intake and he ended up melting his exhaust manifolds and muffler surprised the fuel system didn't catch on fire so remember do this at your own risk these are some really simple and in my opinion safe if you do it properly modifications okay so you went one or two degrees up on the spark you're monitoring your knock sensor and you're monitoring your coolant temps you also want to monitor your air fuel ratio now you say okay under a heavy load i'm gonna pass that guy on the highway so you know when you floor it you're gonna go into performance enrichment you're gonna go open loop well the way you can make performance enrichment perform better is bring it in earlier and add more fuel so there's settings in the tune for when it comes in map sensor is probably the most critical the map sensor usually goes from about 0 to 100 kpa 100 being the kpa at sea level and zero wide open throttle atmospheric so most of these operating systems will go into performance enrichment in the 80s 85 88 kpa that means you're under a heavy load and once it sees that value it'll switch into performance enrichment if the other constraints are met. What are the other constraints? Well, throttle position. If you're at idle, you don't want to go into performance enrichment. So what we can do is we can bring the throttle in a little bit sooner, maybe 5%, and then we can lower the map threshold 5 or 10%. What that's going to do is it's going to put you into performance enrichment a little bit sooner. Now that works great for me because I drive my Jeeps like a baby carriage, and I'm not under a heavy load all the time, so I still stay out of performance enrichment until I need it. But if you're one of these guys that's always on the throttle, I wouldn't mess with performance enrichment. And here's why. If you're cruising down the highway, and I've said this in several videos in the past, a lot of tuners will just dump fuel. I had a guy with a six liter recently that brought it by and says, man, this thing runs great. I took it to a tuner at the track and the throttle response was like a Corvette. I mean, it just ran awesome and it sounded awesome. Problem is he was getting eight miles to the gallon because as soon as he touched the throttle, he was out of closed loop. He was into open loop and he was dumping fuel and spark into it yeah that feels great on the track but if you got to drive the thing three four hundred miles on a tank of gas you want to get reasonable economy then that just doesn't work so well so here's the law of diminishing returns you're on the highway and you're cruising along at 70 miles an hour the world is wonderful you're in closed loop the o2s are switching feedback is working you're getting good economy and good emissions then you decide oh, i'm going to cruise at 75 miles an hour so even on flat ground you kick up your cruise control at 75 miles an hour but i'm going to notice to you that slight additional amount of load kicks you into performance enrichment. Now the computer ignores the O2 sensors and just starts dumping fuel into it. You don't know this, so you cruise all the way to Moab in open loop and you get nine miles to the gallon. I did a video, I'm gonna say about a year ago, where I explained that and I've had several guys call me after that video and say, you know, Robbie, I did what you said. I set my Aero Force gauge to closed loop, open loop, and I drove it, so I stayed in closed loop. And it wasn't even a lot of difference in the pedal position. It was, or miles per hour, it was just a few miles per hour, a few percent in the throttle. And I ended up increasing my mileage dramatically. So here's the point. When you start bringing those performance enrichment parameters down, you're running the risk of running in performance enrichment longer. So even in cruises on the highway, you can be in performance enrichment and then you'll get worse economy. So there's a trade-off. How much performance do you want? How much economy and emissions do you want? Now, of course, guys, I'm just scratching the surface here. There's all sorts of gains to be had in variable valve timing, phasing the cam at different time, and there's a lot of other parameters that you can mess with. But we're just gonna talk about these basic ones, performance enrichment, spark, and one more, and that's rev limiter. Now the rev limiter on the 6.2 and the 5.3s are pretty reasonable. They're in the high fives. You know, GM has pretty much had the high fives as their rev limiter for 20, 30 years. 
on their trucks. But what I find is you can pump them up to about 6,000 RPM because these have what's called soft rev limiters. They don't just run up to that rev limiter if you set it at 6,000 RPM and then stop. They'll start dropping cylinders out of 57, 58, 5900 RPM. So if you set the rev limiter at 6,000 RPM, you really start losing power at 56 to 5700 RPM. First thing you have to do is determine is your engine equipped with active fuel management or not? If you're equipped with active fuel management lifters, my opinion is the end of the world on RPM is 6,000. Set it up to 6,000. They seem to be safe up to about that point. But if you go much more than that, you're probably gonna crunch a lifter. Now GM has these calculated values like 5,635 in third gear and 5,720 in fourth gear, and et cetera. I just run them at 6,000 RPM all across the board, even in reverse, because if you're going 6,000 RPM in reverse is probably not a problem with the operating system, it's probably a problem with you. So by kicking that rev limiter up, we're now bringing the power band up two or 300 RPM, and it's actually pretty dramatic. When you pass on the highway and that thing downshifts, it winds up, and you can pull hard up to about 58, 5900 RPM, it makes a big difference, and that's where we're seeing a lot of horsepowers in those upper RPM ranges in the LSs. and the LTs, we're still seeing the horsepower in the mid-range and bottom end, but in the LSs especially, you're seeing it in the top end. Then you're gonna kick that one degree of spark in at a time on the high octane table until you can feel that throttle response increase and monitor your spark knock, like I said. In fact, look, right now I'm cruising along at a light load. Now, I do have the air conditioning on and this Jeep's all got all sorts of stuff in it, so it's heavy. And I'm constantly running spark knock. So what this is telling me is I got too much timing in it. I've got to lower that table and by doing that we'll probably increase our throttle response because instead of the operating system the operating system just doesn't back it off what it needs it backs it off more than what it needs and then comes back so you're actually going to lose performance by going with too much spark here's the recommended sequence of events to do this simple performance tune first crank your rpm up go to about 6,000 rpm on a standard old LS truck motor. Now if you got an L9H or an engine without active fuel management, you could probably crank it up to about 6200 RPM. The LS3 did not have anything. It didn't, it didn't have VVT, it didn't have active fuel management, and you guys know you can really wind those things up. So on a non-active fuel management engine, I'd probably go to about 6200 RPM. On an active fuel management engine, stay safe and stay at 6000 RPM or less. Now if you guys don't need this performance, don't put it in. If you need that extra performance for passing or whatever, do it. But if you're completely happy with the way your engine runs, run it the way GM delivered it, because it's going to run for a long, long, long time. Uh, the first Jeep we ever did, I just did a video on it, it's turning over 200,000 miles, still runs like a top, doesn't burn any oil, and the tune is completely stock. So first run the rev limiter up to 6,000, then do your spark tuning, then do your performance enrichment. And I'm gonna show you a couple of examples of that. Now, when you do that, make sure that you have some kind of a scan tool. HP Tuners is an awesome product. EFI Live is an awesome product. Aeroforce Gauge is an awesome product. Use a Bluetooth adapter, I don't care. But you gotta be able to monitor the results. If you just blindly start throwing spark and fuel into it, you don't know what's going on. You could turn your engine into a grenade. So you gotta have some feedback. Whatever tuner you're using to tune your engine is probably what you're gonna be using to scan it. Because both EFI Live and HP Tuners have really good scanners built into them. Then take some road trips and look at the results. And you can't get the results over a two mile drive. The engine's cold, you fire it up, you drive it two miles, oh, it's not knocking. No, you gotta go on a long road trip. You gotta look at different conditions with different fuels. And I'll try to get into the final segment here because I'm yakking too much, but the fuel is really gonna determine the tune also. While the tune can adapt to whatever fuel you put in, if you're running 93 octane all the time, then you're gonna be able to tune it for some more performance than if you're running 85. And a lot of my customers do that. They just run premium. And I will say that if you run premium gas, while it does cost more, you also get more benefits. Not only do you get more power, but you get more economy. Because when that spark adaptive or scalar kicks up and puts you into that higher level, you're getting better economy. So you might spend 20 cents a gallon more for premium, but you might get five or 10% better mileage. So performance is directly related to the fuel you're using. That's one of the things they did in World War II, right after World War I, they realized that performance was in superchargers and turbochargers and cramming more air fuel into the chamber, and they had to have higher grades of fuel that had more knock protection. And that's really when a lot of these fuels were developed for higher performance. 
so a little bit about this Jeep. I think it's a 16. It has a L96 6L80. It was done, uh, like I said, just over two years ago. The guy has obviously driven it long and hard in the dirt, and that's kind of what these Jeeps are for. We're gonna see if we can squeeze a little more zip out of it for him. Now, he is adding coolers to this. We just added the, uh, the engine oil cooler, and he did an off-board transmission cooler because he lives out near the dam, and it can top 115, 120 degrees out there. You're crawling on a hot day with the air conditioning on, and that's, that's a lot of heat. So we upgraded his engine oil cooler. And remember, guys, what I said about the engine oil temperature. It's a calculated value in most of these tuners, so take that number with a grain of salt. But any heat that you can get away from the front of the grill and off to the sides or into the atmosphere is just going to help everything overall. All right, guys, here we are in the field doing some tuning. I'm using EFI Live this time. And first thing you're going to do is you're going to read your tune and you are going to save it. So once you save your tune, lock it away. Don't modify it. Don't play with it because if you screw stuff up, you might have to come back to it. So once this is saved, we're then going to save as, meaning create a new file, and then we're going to modify that file and put it back in. EFI Live takes a little more time than HP Tuners. The interface is a little bit different. I think the GUI on the HP Tuners is a little bit easier to use. This folder right here, if you can see it, is save as. So we're going to come back here and we're going to name it as uh, Robbie Reed. And today's date is the 27th. And this is the ECM. Now, in EFI Live, you have to save the ECM and the TCM independently of each other. So, we've now saved that. And now we're going to save it as, same tune, except this time I'm going to add modded at the end. So here under General Spark, we're going to look at the high and the low octane table. Now there's a high and low octane normal table and then one for AFM, which is your four-cylinder mode. All these things here are modifiers, like, let me see if I can zoom in a little for you guys. So, if the intake air temp goes up and down, that can modify the spark. If your EGR valve is on or off, although we don't have an EGR valve in this engine, flex fuel, that's the alcohol content. Um, so these are modifiers, coolant temp. Um, so if the coolant temp goes up or down, that's gonna modify it. But we're not gonna mess with any of that. This is simple tuning. If you come here to your low octane table, you will see Here's the values GM puts in. Now we're not gonna mess with that because if you mess with these low values and you force them up and you run crappy fuel, your knock sensors are gonna start pulling that spark back and you're gonna get less performance than you, you would if you didn't mess with it. All we're gonna do is add one degree to this high octane spark table. So if you click an individual cell, you can modify that cell. But here's an easy way to do it in EFI Live. Click this upper left corner, come up here. Now this is a little confusing in EFI Live and this is why Sometimes guys say HP tuners are a little bit easier to use. You can plus or minus uh, a number. So what we want to do is put in two and actually, actually let's just go one degree at a time. So we're going to put in one and we're going to hit plus and watch how everything on the table goes up one. Okay, so we just went up one degree and we're going to save that. Next thing we're going to look at is engine protection. This is where your rev limiter is going to be. You can pick up a lot of horsepower in the top end just by changing this parameter. So you're gonna go rev limiter by gear, and this has already been modified. If you notice, we're at 6,000, 6,000, 5,700. Um, neutral and park, leaving about 3,500. You don't wanna be revving it up and throwing a rod. Let's get fifths and sixths up to uh, 6,000. I don't see any reason why not. Now, remember my caveat, if you have AFM, 6,000 is the end of the world. This engine does not have AFM. But it's a 6 liter, and really 6,000 RPM is about the end of the line for the intake airflow. So we're going to leave it at 6,000. Now, this has to be matched with a TCM, because if this value is lower than the TCM shift point, let's say your TCM shifted at 6,200, it's never going to shift, because 
you're going to hit 6,000 RPM and the engine is going to stop revving. It's actually going to stop revving at about 5,700 because it's a soft rev limiter, dropping cylinders out. Transmission's waiting for 6,200 to shift and it ain't going to shift. This is where you're going to pick up most of your horsepower, right here in the upper RPM range. So let's save that. Now we're going to move on to something that you guys really need to be careful with, and that's power enrichment. It's under fuel. When you open this power enrichment up, first thing you're going to do is go to parameters. And this is this tune here is pretty aggressive. If you look at the map threshold, that is 55 kPa, and it's 0 to 100 kPa. So that means it's enabling performance enrichment really early at 50 kPa. That's not that you're you're not on the throttle very hard to achieve that. But there's other qualifiers that will dictate when this comes in. Now a lot of times you'll see this up about 85, so that you practically have to be floored to get this to go. So I'm going to leave 55 alone, and these other qualifiers will determine the performance enrichment. Now hysteresis means how much does it have to to go below or above to change the previous parameter, just like a cooling fan. So let's go now into our throttle threshold, and our throttle threshold is at 87%. So you see we have to be at almost 90% throttle before performance enrichment will kick in. So we're going to take this value and let's drop it down to 85. And here's another way you can do that in EFI Live. Put 85 in, then just hit number and watch they'll all change to 85. And then go ahead and save your tune. The final parameter we're going to change in performance enrichment is the PE mode commanded. Now we really got to be careful here, guys, because I've had customers come in. You notice this is 0.8. This is 0.8 lambda. If you look up here, it says lambda. And the lower this number, the more fuel you're going to be putting in. Now, there's other ways to calculate air fuel ratio, including air fuel ratio. You can command 12 to 1, 11 to 1. There's alpha. But we're going to be using lambda because that's what EFI Live has this set up for. So 0.8 is pretty good. That means you're going to be running about 12 to 1. Now you can see that it leans out a little bit here as the RPMs go up. Let's just change this whole value to 0.8 right now. So again, we're going to come up here, make sure you put that point in. I have had guys put 8% in, and it's just like taking a cup and pouring fuel into your tank or into your uh, engine. So we got 0.8. Now you can see these are all 0.8. Double check it. Let's save it. So now we have our ECM basically ready to go. This tune has been labeled modded, as you can see, so that we know that if something is amiss, we can go back. We are going to load this tune. And in EFI Live, you've got three things here. You've got read the tune, calibration right only, and full right. So we're going to go calibration only. It's going to say yes when I'm, I'm doing, and I'm sorry I'm looking at my phone, so I'm not... Let me come back here and... So this is probably only going to take 30 to 40 seconds to do a calibration right. What wonderful days we live in that we don't have to pull chips out of the computer and put them in a tool and program them on a desktop and then bring them back to the vehicle. Okay, so we have programmed successfully. We're going to close this. We're going to wait for the countdown. What we're going to do is we're going to come up and hit this green arrow which is going to wipe everything out. And we're not going to read an E38. We're going to read a T43, which is what this vehicle has. And you can see that this is the TCM that's inside of the transmission. Uh, I'm not going to check the status because I know it's going to be good. So let's go ahead and start the read. It's going to take a few minutes. We'll come back. All right, so we just got done flashing the TCM. A good idea now and I'll do this in another video but guys when you put a new ECM in and sometimes when you do a full flash it's gonna throw a PO315 crank variation not learned crank variation not learned is a more of an emissions related code what happens is it asks you to floor the engine while it's in a certain mode and the computer takes a picture of the crankshaft pattern and then it uses that for comparative purposes for misfire detection so if an engine starts to misfire, it can tell which cylinder is misfiring and how badly by comparing it to that learned crank variation. So if you get a PO315, don't change your crank sensor. Don't freak out. It's just an emissions-related code, and most of these scanners can, uh, can clear it. 
All right, so we're just finished reading the TCM. Let it do its countdown. Now, I'm not going to do a whole lot of messing here in the TCM because there's really no reason to. These six-speed transmissions pretty much shift perfect right out of the gate. Now, they do shift a little lazy and old vanish, and some guys think they're sluggish compared to the 4L60s. Um, I personally like the way they shift, and they're adaptive, so I probably wouldn't mess with it, but that's up to you. So I'm going to show you a little trick here in the transmission. Now, by the way, this is a 6.2 calibration, and you can tell right here from the VIN number. Uh, B, the 8th and the 10th are your year in your engine. So the 10th is the year, and B is 2011. 2010 is A, 2011 is B, 2012 is C, etc. F is L94. So we're running an L94 tune in this 6.0, and they work awesome. Now, if you had a 6-liter tune in this vehicle, you would have to do a lot more work than I'm doing right now. So I recommend that if you want better performance, just put a base 6.2 L94 tune in your 6-liter, and you'll be amazed at the difference. Okay, so if we come here to trans calibration, we have to look at the shift control and the wide open throttle RPM. Now look how this is kind of all over the place. Now this is a 6.2, and you can see that it shifts as early as 5200 or 5400 RPM. So this is not good. If you're shifting at 5200 RPM, you're probably dropping 30 horsepower because that, that's where these engines put a lot of their horsepower out. They're not like the LTs where they're monsters off the line. Rather than mess with every pattern, now notice you have the normal pattern, shift pattern A, shift pattern B, there's tap up, tap down, um, and tap up, tap down is pretty much just uh, deleted because they've just put this high number in. But since we put 6,000 RPM in the engine, let's make the transmission shift about 100 RPM, 100 to 200 RPM earlier than that. So we're going to come up here and we're going to put in 5,900. That's going to be a really safe number. And when I hit number, you're going to see all those parameters change. Let's go ahead and save it. No, we don't want to save it as a, just a nothing. So what we're going to do is we're going to come in to save as here. And we're going to pick out this one. Now, guys, I just violated my own rule. That is, we're not going to save this at all. In fact, we're going to undo all the changes, which you can do right here with this arrow. Hit it until it's grayed out. Now you'll notice that everything is back to where it was. We're going to save it as the stock TCM read. Sorry, kind of hard to do this with the phone. So now we have a base tune that we can come back with if we have to. Now we're going to save it as. Same thing, but we're going to add modded to the end. And I know this is a little confusing for some of you guys, but we don't want to be modifying our base tune. So now we're going to come back. We've got all of our numbers hit up, lit up. We got our 5900 up here. We're going to hit the number sign and we're back to 5900. Now, if we save it, it's going to save it as the modded tune, as you can see here. So, yes. All right. So now we got our RPM where we want it. We're going to look at, and this is all I want you to really change on a transmission. Uh, U0121. That's usually the only code you're going to throw in a transmission and search it. Now you notice it says non-emissions. U0121 says that you lost communication with the ABS module. We don't need that. So we're just going to come up here and we're going to set it to not reported. So now we're going to come back and download the calibration. Now EFI Live does not have the ability to do a full flash on this and you can tell because this full flash is grayed out. HP tuners in most of these early Gen 4s does have the option of doing a full flash, but we're not going to do it on this one, obviously. So let's hit uh, start. And yes. And we're going to come back when it's done.
All right, we're back. And I forgot to do something I wanted to do on this specific vehicle. This vehicle has an SS fan in it. It was originally equipped with a Pentstar. And I want to make some improvements to the cooling fan. Now, most of you guys know that the Camaro SS fan is the preferred fan for us. And I'm going to show you why right now. Let's close everything up. Let's go to System, Fans. And you'll notice that we are pulse with electric. And we're not seeing the Hertz here and the reason is that EFI Live doesn't have that capability so if you want to change the Hertz you can come here and change it from discrete to Elasco Viscous etc but the Hertz that we want may not be present here so that means we got to tune the fan with different software so we're not going to mess with that but what we are going to do is come here to engine cooling temp now you will notice that this fan is running 40 percent all the time and I'm not exactly sure why. I know that this guy lives in Boulder City and it gets really hot there. And I'm a big fan of the evacuation fan, letting the fan run at a low speed all the time. But it's not that hot out right now. And this guy just made a bunch of efforts to get more airflow into his grill. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring this down to zero up to 95 degrees C, which is about 200 degrees. That means the fan is going to shut off at that point and then we're going to bring it in at 35 here and we're going to leave it at that this fan is very powerful so it's rare it's ever going to run 40 50 percent well let's just say 50 60 percent and you'll notice that we capped it off at about 75 percent and the reason is because all the other riders that we talked about you take air temp vehicle speed transmission temp the gm operating system is working it for all that so we're going to save that and we're going to do a quick download with that and that should shut the fan off and really you're not going to hear this Camaro SS fan 90% of the time. You're only going to hear it when it's under a really heavy load. So there you go guys. That was pretty simple. Let's see if this thing is going to start. The 6.2 tune doesn't just add performance but it'll clean this motor up because this engine is really designed as you saw for heavy duty trucks and the performance enrichment is really aggressive and spark timing is really conservative so this thing is probably going to get better gas mileage run cleaner and be more zippy with a 6.2 tune so the first thing you're going to want to do is look at long-term fuel trims remember i've told you how important that is see you in the next video